Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. This channel is not monetized, I don't advertise on it, and there's no way for me to make money by you watching this video, which is why you don't have to sit through any adverts. If you do want to support me though, you can always buy me a coffee, there's a link in the description for that, or you can visit the 10% True website and grab one of these fantastic t-shirts. That way you look cool, I make a couple of dollars from the sale, and everyone wins. Anyway, I'll let you get back to the scheduled programming. Enjoy. Mike, welcome back to 10 Century. Thanks for joining us on the channel again. It's my pleasure. Last time you were with us, Mike, you gave us a, a fascinating tour of the front cockpit of the F4G um, without wishing to skip over uh, your OV-10 time. You also flew the Bronco. We are today going to talk about your time flying the F4G and, and you have put together a slideshow which you're going to share with the audience um, to help yes, you narrate your combat time, uh, the story behind your combat time in F4G. So but be before you do that, Spike, tell us a little bit then about you. How did you get interested in aviation? Um, and how did you end up flying the F4G? Well, that's pretty easy. Um, growing up in the early 60s, space and jet developments were always at the forefront in, in the news. My dad worked for an airline, not as a pilot, but I was exposed to airplanes quite a bit. And uh, they were cool. Your heroes back in the day were not rappers and criminals, but rather astronauts, scientists, test pilots, badasses. Um, we lived next to an airport, so there were planes flying over all the time. It actually, that airport had about four civilian-owned P-51s at it. We'd see them all the time flying over. So it was just a natural evolution. Um, I learned to fly when I was 18 in the civilian world as a stepping stone because I always wanted to eventually end up being an airline pilot. Then I thought my only real means to get there is to join either the Navy or the Air Force. Well, that was the Carter years and I was lucky to get a pilot slot and I got in the Air Force and didn't initially join to be a fighter pilot. And I also thought I was just gonna do seven years and get. But when I got to pilot training and, and started yanking and banking and flying upside down, I said, this is the most fun you can have with your pants on. So I changed tracks and, and wanted to become a fighter pilot. They were, they were short of fighters in my class. And so I got an OV-10, which was used as kind of a holding pool for fighter capable graduates that didn't get a fighter right away. So I flew the OV-10 Bronco for two and a half years and learned a lot about doing air to ground stuff and coordinating with fighters. And then out of the OV-10, I got an F-4E. I thought that was going to segue into a Strike Eagle at Seymour Johnson. And instead, I got shoehorned into the Weasel, which at the time, I thought, damn the luck. But looking back on my life now, I wouldn't change a thing because it turned out it was the best flying I ever did. Uh, the greatest people I ever met, the greatest memories I ever made were all in the Weasel. And because of that... We're going to talk about flying the F-4, mostly the weasel, and the experiences in the Gulf War today. Before you jump in, and I know we want to get to this quickly, so I'm not going to ask too many questions, but before you jump in, Spike, just tell me a little bit about, or tell us a little bit about, um, how difficult or how easy you found the process of becoming a fighter pilot. It's not easy, and it's not for everybody. Um. I would say in the civilian world, probably 60 to 70% of people who want to learn to fly can. However, those that just try to do it through the civilian route, probably less than a fourth will actually finish the process because life gets in the way and it becomes expensive and so they just quit. But the ability to just learn how to basically drive a car in the sky I'd say most people can do it. Uh, when you get to pilot training and you start yanking and banking upside down, within the first two months, probably 20 to 30% drop out. 
they either wash out because they're not capable or they quit because they find they don't like it. Uh, back in those, day, in those days, everyone went through the same track. We flew the T-37, then the T-38. And they decided in the T-38, if you had the ability and the wherewithal to fly a fighter, that was called being FARD, Fighter Attack Reco Reconnaissance Qualified. And in any given class, I would say the upper third would probably be FARD. So if you look at the, the physical screening process to become a military pilot, and then the uh, attrition that happens along the way, and then just the capabilities, you're probably talking out of the public, one out of a hundred, maybe, or maybe one out of a thousand. I actually used to uh, quote this to my students when they graduate that uh, out of the T-38, that roughly 70,000 people have ever earned their wings in a T-38. And during that time, 700 million Americans have lived. So if I'm doing the math right, I think that's one out of 10,000. Yeah. So, and then it, just learning to how to, then once you finish that training and then learning how to do the, the multidimensional chess game called being a fighter pilot, especially the air to air part. It's, it's really a multidimensional chess game because you think not just in three axes of up, down, left, right, but fast, slow energy. Where am I now? Where is he going to be in a few seconds? And uh, it, it's mind and life altering. It really is. Okay. Tell us about the F4G then. All right. Are you ready? I am. I started off my operational career. Well, let me put back up. I was flying the OV-10 Bronco at George Air Force Base. And as fate would have it, when I got my F4E slot, I parked in the same parking lot. I just went to the next building next door to start F4E training, the 21st Tactical Fighter Training Squadron. Um, basic training in the F4 was, uh, let's see, I think it was eight months. From there, I went straight down the flight line to the G model school, which was another four months, learning the airplane flew basically the same. The gun was gone. Now we had the APR-38, which later became the APR-47, the radar locating equipment. And it was mostly about learning how to employ the, the radar-seeking missiles. We had two, the AGM-45 Shrike, which was Vietnam era, and very limited and restricted in how you'd have to use it. The newer missile, the, the HARM, AGM-88, much more capable, much easier to employ. But then I went straight over to Germany to the 81st TAC Fighter Squadron, the best squadron I was ever in, and uh, the Panthers. And so here we go. There's uh, an 81st jet taking off somewhere out of the UK. And what's unusual about it, I can tell it's at an air show because it doesn't have an ECM pod underneath the left sparrow well. but It doesn't have a travel pod underneath each pylon. So I'm not sure what, but it's a great picture because look at the freaking heat coming out of that thing. So I show up in Germany and um, it's still the middle of the Cold War. It's April of 1988. And... It was the best flying I ever did. In the States, if you wanted to fly low level, you had to be on the specified low level route. Back then, we could fly anywhere in Germany pretty much at 500 feet and 500 knots. It was a license of steel. Uh, the Canadians were at 300 feet and the Brits were at somewhere so as not to touch the ground. In theory, they were at 100 feet, but I know some guys that actually clipped guy wires on aerials with a tornado. So yeah, they were low. Um, when I got to Germany, um, the Air, uh, we didn't know it, but the Air Force was already planning on getting rid of the weasel. And they because they only built about 112 F4Gs, there weren't enough to go around. So they used to fly F4E model wingmen that could carry a Shrike. And the idea was the G model with this specialized antenna group here in the nose and all the electronics that went with it, we would find the target, 
And then we could direct the E-model to shoot a couple shrikes, and then we could shoot harms, which were much more capable. Well, the Air Force was planning on getting rid of the airplane because the Air Force is expensive to maintain and operate. So we started flying mixed pairs. Each squadron, there were three of them at Spangdalem. Half the guys were F-16 drivers and half of us were F-4 crew. The F-16s were carrying shrikes initially. We carried the harms and it was low altitude tactics, largely calm out. And by calm out, that means we would try to do it without the radio. There were visual signals involving wing rocks and other aircraft maneuvers that would, we would use to point our wingmen at the target to tell them when to shoot. And we were trying to stay low because the assumption was if the Warsaw Pact tried to get to the grocery stores in Germany, uh, they had a lot of surface to air threats and we needed to stay low so they couldn't shoot us. This comes into play in a minute. Here's another picture, a little more realistic. This is uh, these these are uh, 480th jets, but I've flown this one too. And standard loadout. They're carrying a couple harms. Later, they gave the F-16 a limited ability to shoot the harm, but he was still largely dependent upon us to point him at the target. And he had to use pre-canned parameters. He couldn't just say, listen to that. That's what's going into the missile. Go get it. But typical scene flying over the German countryside. Uh, I think they're headed back to Point Alpha to go land. That's what it looks like. And we even, in this is in uh, August of 1990, we did an exchange squadron with uh, the Brit RAF uh, GR1 squadron, 15 squadron at RAF Larbrook. And their whole game plan was to fly low, dropping the JP-233 runway denial weapon. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. That comes into play in the Gulf War. So here's a picture of the mixed pair flying with two 15 squadron tornadoes. Um, this also is a strange coincidence in just a moment. And you wouldn't believe all the hoops I had to jump through to get permission from the generals to even make this formation flight happen. Are, are you, are you flying the F4 in that formation or are you taking? The uh, I think I was taking the photo. I can't remember, but I'm, I know I'm not in the, in that jet. All right. So for the audience, um, when I joined the Air Force, I honest to God thought I would never be in a war. You asked me about this the other day. And the reason being that we had the debacle of Vietnam and the only combat that had happened since was a short thing in Grenada, which was, if you're familiar with that. Just cools, yeah. And uh, I called it just because. <laughs> And I honestly thought that we weren't going to get involved in any brush fire skirmishes. If there was a war, it was going to be the big one. And I didn't foresee World War III really happening because, well, that would be insanity. Yet, in August of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and we got called in on a Saturday. And the next thing we knew was half the squadron was being deployed to Bahrain, except we didn't know. Uh, I didn't go in the initial wave due to some uh, family issues that were going on. All we knew was the guys were in a secret location. Okay. Um, I, I kind of highlighted the map here so that hopefully people can see it. So we got the borders of Kuwait. The green line shows the rough border between Iraq and Iran. The black line is the Saudi Iraqi border. And these two red lines are approximately the 36th parallel and the 32nd parallel, which comes into play in the no-fly zones after the war. So Bahrain, um, it turns out that a lot of Middle East countries had been secretly building air bases because, well, they don't really trust each other. And here you can, you can see is Sheikh Isa Air Base at the south end of the island. I am told the reason they built it down there was because there's a lot of oil right here because it's only about 20 or 30 miles across the water here to Qatar. Well, of course, both countries say that's mine. 
So the Sheikh built his runway here. Here's my point. <clears throat> the first guys to get there were the weasels from George Air Force Base in California. This base, like many others, was not even on a map. Nobody had any frequencies. I am told they sent a guy ahead via commercial air to the, uh, okay, the commercial airport's right here. They sent him there via commercial air and in some, I guess he took a taxi down to the base. When the first jets got there from George, they circled the island looking for the runway. Since there were no known frequencies, he was up in the control tower and used guard frequency to contact them to clear them to land. Okay. Uh, by the time the Spangdalem jets got there, uh, they were starting to issue approach books with airports and frequencies that were marked secret and had red covers. So they're probably in Biden's basement now. Oop, did I say that? <laughs> Uh, this was not down there at the time. This is some fancy land development, just like uh, Dubai is doing. Also, I think it's a way for the Sheikh to say, look, I'm pushing my territorial boundary out another three miles into Qatar. All right, now we're going to zoom in. Oh, I will say this. Uh, the north end of the island in the capital city of Manama is kind of cosmopolitan. It's actually got agriculture because there's underground water here. This right here is the shipping docks, and there's a U.S. Navy base there, but they kind of downplay it. They don't call it Fifth Fleet Headquarters. They call it the Administrative Support Unit, because that sounds like it's nothing, but it's been there since 1945. So 15 Squadron that we did that exchange with, they ended up deploying to Maharik, and their guys were staying at the Hilton downtown, whereas we were staying on base. Here's a, a close-up of the base. Right now, now it has two runways, but during the war, it only had one, and it had a parallel taxiway. They hastily built a taxiway loop down here. This is not the same one, but we called it the South Loop, and our jets were parked all around this loop. This, the Marines were parked on this ramp, there were fuel bladders here, gigantic ones. And so when you'd land and taxi back in, you'd stop here. They, while you were still running, they'd hook up a fuel line to you, hot fuel you, and you'd taxi back in. This long road was back to the barracks and such that we stayed in. And this stuff didn't even exist back then. Here's a zoom in of the barracks area. I will point out that None of these orchards existed at the time. None of these swimming pools existed at the time. This thing looks like a multi-story hotel. I have no idea what that is. But these were the main barracks that we stayed in. I was in this building right here on the second floor. This was the chow hall. No, this was the chow hall. And that was the mosque. Uh, the main gate goes out that way. Uh, they, they hastily built a sewage treatment plant over here on the shore. Sometimes it kind of stank. This is a view from in front of my barracks. So it's, it's clean and it was new. It was built by the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and allegedly it was only about two years old. But as you can see, it's, it's pretty austere. There's not a whole lot of stuff there. Looking, um, oh, this is the entrance to the chow hall. And this is the food line. There's a 561st guy getting some food. The food was actually pretty good. It was mostly Middle Eastern fare, but it was actually pretty good. Uh, there's the cooks behind the counter. And all that food line is behind this wall up here. So you'd get your food, you'd eat. And then oftentimes we just sit in these couches here and watch CNN 30 feet away because it was almost our daily intelligence brief because you'd watch and somebody like Peter Arnett would be in Baghdad, and you'd think, well, those are some of my buddies up there on the news right now. It's kind of strange. This is what it looked like inside our room. So here's my building. There were, there were nine of us in my room. Each room was about 20 by 20 feet, probably about a 12 or 14 foot ceiling. They gave us a mattress and a frame to put it on. 
but we kind of just gathered bits and pieces of wood. Oh, some of the guys actually got these little closet arrangements. I think mine was made out of wood from an old discarded pallet, but we're all just kind of crammed in there. It, was it comfortable? Yes. Was it air conditioned? Yes. Um, community shower and bathroom down the hallway. There's some funny stuff there too. This is looking northeast and east from my barracks. So we were quite close to the water. And before the war started, the sky and the water were incredibly blue. It, it was, it didn't even seem real. This, I must have taken these pictures after the war because by then uh, he'd lit the oil fields on fire. And so the sky tended to be dirtier in the water. He dumped oil in the water. It was kind of dirty too. This was our compound out by the South Loop. Um, it was dubbed Fort Apache. Um, each squadron had a trailer that we used as an operations center. And that's these things here as well. This was the life support uh, shack where our helmets and our G suits and harnesses were stored. There's a generator. There was field wire strung everywhere and a series of loudspeakers for whenever there was a scuttle on. And then, so picnic benches, what we call civil engineers, um, they'd take old wood and stuff and make stuff for us. Uh, me clowning around in front of the, the barracks. <laughs> Another view, this is the mosque viewed from the, uh, the chow hall and just outside the perimeter fence of the base. Yeah, you can see stuff like that. This is along the northern perimeter fence of the base. And I took this two series of shots here just to kind of show the vastness and the desolation there. So we get, you see some hardened aircraft shelters here. Way over here are the hangars and the control tower at the main ramp. This is post-war. Um, I'm told there were over 5,000 troops on the base at its peak. Here's a view from the ramp area. So we had two jets inside every revetment area. These are corrugated steel. They were just filled with desert sand. And within a couple of years, they fell over and then they just got rid of them. Here's a spare J79 engine on a trailer. Uh, oh, the very first day that we taxied out for our first mission, this gigantic flag was standing there. And it got to everybody. It really did. Gets me right now. Here's a view underneath a jet, just to kind of show some of the stuff going on there. Uh, mechanics working in an engine bay. There's the engine sitting back there. Here's an AIM-7F mounted on the rail with all its flags. This is the Patriot battery, which was just south of our ops area. Hopefully I'll have time to talk about that story. This is my backseater, a Larry L.A. Bud Allen. I flew almost all of my 31 combat stories with him. Um, this was the day before the war. And so we decided to go take some pictures. And there's a lot of bravado in this picture, but I think we were both pretty nervous. I know I was. Um, everybody was growing a combat mustache. The, the, the vow was, if, if you know anything about the rules for mustaches in the US Air Force, Oh, my God, they look ridiculous. You have to be trimmed to the end of your mouth. It basically, it makes you look like Hitler. Well, we, we grew these big old Robin Holds combat stashes. And it, what everyone said was, it doesn't come off until I go home or they ship me home in a body bag. So more bravado. Uh, this picture, my, the, our hero shot was actually shot after the war. My mustache has filled in much better. And I'm a lot more relaxed because, well, it's all over, but it's a great shot. Uh, you can see a couple harms hanging underneath and what else? And you can see a good detail on the corrugated revetments. They're the same kind of revetments they had in Vietnam. Um, I put artwork on almost every harm I flew with. Can you see the shark mouth that's drawn there? Yeah. Um, couldn't draw on the, the seeker head antenna itself. And it's kind of hard to see, but this one says Baghdad Buster on it. This must have been, that must have been the first one. I, I don't remember writing words on them, but I, I drew a shark mouth on almost every one of them. 
And the harm is a huge missile, as you saw, sitting on it. It weighs about 800 pounds. All right, so uh, I'm going to try to talk about four specific missions that stand out. And uh, to do so, I'm going to just highlight the base down here at the south end of Bahrain. I think we were about 200 miles from Kuwait, maybe 300, I can't remember. But we take off, fly north. On the, on the first mission, we refueled about right here. Then we went over the water to support an F-16 attack against an SA-6 battery right about here. If we were, and if we were supporting Kuwait, we would carry four harm missiles because we only had a single centerline fuel tank. If we were going up near Baghdad, we had to download two of those missiles and, and carry three fuel tanks. Uh, if we were going way up here, we would take off, go to a tanker, go in, come out, have to go to the tanker again to come home. If we were going way out west, and I did some of that, take off, go to a tanker to go to the next tanker to go in, come out, tanker, tanker, home. And that's how some of the sorties ended up being over six hours long. Hmm. Some of the guys that did the Great Scud hunt were airborne for almost 12 hours as they just went back and forth trying to find scuds that really weren't out there. Um, I'm going to talk about the first one that went here. I'm going to talk about the sortie that we lost our number three wingman. They were okay, but they lost the jet. I'm going to talk about flying directly over Kuwait City the night after that, and then getting shot at by an SA-2 right about here late in the war. Spike. Before you yes, get started, sir. can I ask you some background questions then? I Certainly. don't want to interrupt your flow, so well, I'll keep it brief. But no, no. You, you, you just mentioned that you were certainly, um, I don't know if you said anxious or, you didn't say nervous. I don't know if you said anxious. I can't remember what. what I'll what say scared. You, you were scared. How did you deal with that then? And what, what if it's if it's not a completely stupid question, what were you scared of? Dying, being shot down, being captured, failing? What, what um, scared you? Everything. Um, now, on a, on the th on the personal personal threat side, I was confident in the abilities of the APR-47 to find the radar threats. Uh, so I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about guns, but I was more worried about MiGs. And, okay, and that's, a, that's actually an excellent question. So prior to the war, I'd been to numerous exercises and red flags in the OB-10 and one in the F-4, and the intent was good. They wanted you to, to practice fighting the best possible adversaries you could face. Well, so you'd go there, and the bad guys were always as good or better than you were. They were weapon school guys. They had tons of time in the airplane. When I went to, to uh, Red Flag in the F-4, I'd only been flying it a year and a half, so I was pretty good, but not super good. Um, and it wasn't until after the war that I realized if you always assume that your opponent is as good as you are, it drives how you do your tactics and your thinking. We were never taught, what do you think he's likely to do? And that, and that colored my post-war flying where I realized the Iraqis are not as good as me. I can easily kick their ass. And, and, I was much more confident after that. I'd say, and it took about 10 days of, of combat before I realized that I was going to be okay. But mostly I was afraid that some MiG was going to sneak up behind me with his radar off so it, I wouldn't detect him. And next thing I'd know is I'm soaking up some kind of a heat shot. That, and you, you don't want to let down your squadron mates. You don't want to let down the strikers that you're supporting. That's all our, our whole purpose is to make it safe so that the strikers can get in and drop their bombs. So there's there's a lot of riding on it. Did you reflect at all, or, uh, or 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 maybe if I ask it differently, did the the weight of history sit on your shoulders? You know, it's a mission. The Wild Weasel mission is a very particular skill set, a very specific mission. 
quite well known, perhaps even infamous, because it's batshit crazy to go out and taunt these <laughs> sounds, get them to shoot at you so you can shoot back. But did that sit on your shoulders? Was there any reflection, inward reflection on your part around what other people were doing and whether or not actually it would have been better to have got a strike eagle at Seymour after all? Um, I don't know if I, if I don't know if I had the cognizance to, to think of weight of history at that point, it's more a case of, well, I wanted to live. Um, I didn't want to let my squadron mates down and I didn't want to let the other guys down. You know, it's, this has been said by, by sage poets throughout history that, Soldiers fight for their comrades in arms more than they fight for their own country. You know what I mean? So the, the platoon, those guys will do heroic things to save their buddy. They don't, it doesn't necessarily mean they believe in the cause itself. They're doing their duty there, but they fight for their friends. And, and you see that in combat accounts all the time. So I, I would say that's probably the primary motivator. Final question then, Spike, before I let you get on then. In the run-up to the conflict, so you know, I talked to a bunch of Eagle guys and they said in the run-up to the war, so this is August 1990 and then the war started in January 1991, so in that sort of three or four-month period, they would rush the border to see what the Iraqi um, defences did and what their reaction was, and then the Iraqis were sending MiG-25 high-fast flyers along to see what the coalition would do. What were you guys doing to test the Iraqi air defense systems and to build well, your electronic order of battle? I can't really say prior to January because I didn't get to Bahrain. And they took the rest of the squadron when they decided to build it up some more. Uh, they took the rest of us uh, the end of December. So I got to Bahrain, I think it was December 27th. The first change, and when I showed the pictures of the Spangdalem and then flying with 15 squadron, we had predicated all of our tactics on flying low altitude to stay below radar and then trying to avoid guns by being backed away. Down low, the airplane flies pretty good. You've got adequate G available to maneuver. I mean, we used to do tactical turns when we were weaseling at four, four and a half, sometimes five Gs. Well, as soon as I get down there, I find out, well, now we're go we're not going to fly. You don't know offset boxes. Hmm. If number one and number two are a mile and a half apart. Then three and four are a mile and a half apart, and a mile and a half or so behind one and two. <clears throat> well, we're not going to do that. We're going to fly high altitude up in the low twenty thousand foot range, say around twenty three to twenty four thousand. Why? To avoid all the guns they have. Oh, well, then how are we going to maneuver? Well. I flew almost all my combat sorties at night. You can't fly visual formations at night. Well, now you can with, with night vision goggles, but we couldn't then. So now we're flying radar trail formations where I was about six miles behind. I was number two. I'd be six miles behind number one, about 30 degrees offset. And number three would be six miles behind me. And number four would be six miles behind him. At that altitude, carrying three fuel tanks, two harms, two AIM-7s, and a jamming pod, you could only get about a G and a half. Wow. So, and you, we didn't have the gas to use afterburner. When we'd go up to Baghdad, we were usually fragged to be on station for 15 minutes, but we usually only had enough gas for 12. So we almost always overflew our bingo because we wanted because we had to support the bombers until they were all off target so that was what i learned in the two weeks prior to the war of this is how we've adapted to the situation does that help yeah it does okay let's go to the next picture uh this picture i love this picture it was taken by another reconnaissance f4 all the f4s were at shaky's air base so there were 24 jets from the 561st, the WW code, I'm from George. And there were 24 jets from Spang. And what they'd done at Spang Dolan was they did a, they took all the F4Gs from the 480th and all the F4Gs from the 81st that I was in, smushed us together, and we were a new squadron. 
as the 81st. <clears throat> and so there were 24, 24, and I believe there were 24 reckeys as well. So this recce, his wingman, took this picture in the refueling track. Uh, you can see the sprocket cut out in the film. That's what these little, let me move this over. That's what the little holes in the corners are. <laughs> anyway, it's a great picture. And it captures the desolation of Saudi. There's just nothing out there in the desert, just sand. Uh, three bag jets, two harms apiece. I wish I had a better resolution picture of this. Um, this black-nosed F4G is tail number 212. It was our jet. These two jets are Spang jets. These two jets are George jets. And this is prior to the war, and they did a promo PR shot to kind of spook the Iraqis. These jets are all carrying four harms apiece. Again, it's, you know, tactical uh, deception, if you want to call it that. But the black-nosed jet, 212, was the high flyer of all the weasels, and I've also been told it was the high flyer of all jets in theater. It flew 69 times during the war. 60 freaking nine times. And you can always tell because it was the only one that had a black radio. I flew it on its very last combat sorry, And they did a, a, a write-up on it in the base paper. Uh, this is a great shot. I actually took this picture. I, it looks like it's in combat because there's harms on that jet, but there's no travel or there's no uh, jamming pod. So we must have been en route to an air show. But it's a great picture. Uh, Post-war hero shot on tail 212 with the black nose. And I am right there with my sleeves rolled up wearing sunglasses. Again, it's, I wish I had better resolution, but it's not the greatest. All right, but that was an official photo shoot with all the guys in the squadron. This is post-war. And I'm going to talk about the missions here in a second. As soon as the war ended, nobody knew it was going to happen. They had a ceasefire, but no actual end. So they decided to leave 16 jets and 16 crews. And we were the shakies of the 16, all from Spangdalem. That's me right there. And for some reason, they left uh, Gene Patton, the vice wing commander from George, behind to be in charge of us. And he was an awesome guy. Really enjoyed having him there. Some of the guys went up to Kuwait and brought back this SA-2 radar dish. And it used to sit on a pole outside our squadron back in Germany once we got home. Right, I got to see what picture I got next here. I think it's the map. Oh, there's oil field fires. Uh, you can see the intake and the ramp because Backseater took the pictures, but they're uh, pretty dramatic. Got one more here. Ah. Highway of Death. You heard about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The first time I saw it, I thought, Jesus Christ. But afterward and stuff I've read, there wasn't as much death there as it was used car parking lot got bombed. So in other words, a couple guys got bombed and they abandoned the vehicles and ran. So most of the vehicles that were destroyed were actually empty. And I didn't learn that for years afterward. Um, these are some kind of weapons shelters, and I don't know where. I would, I'm would, i guessing it might be Ali Al Salem in uh, Kuwait, but every one of them has been hit by a precision-guided munition, and they're all blown up. All right, let's see what's going to get next. Oh, this is post-war. The Nimitz came into the Gulf, and they missed the action. They wanted to get off the boat. So we hosted them at Shake Easy for a week. And then we did a little formation flying. Um, I was flying the photo ship on this, and my backseater took the picture. And there's another pic from the same shoot. Here's a pic that just shows the harms, ALQ-131 pod, the AIM-7s. Um, and that is the only picture I think I've ever seen of me in flight <laughs> and i can actually tell that's me all right let me see what i got i think i can oh they they hosted us on the boat and uh we flew out onto the nimitz on a, a c2 cod and i actually got to steer the ship for about 10 minutes and it was a hell of a lot harder than it looked um all right segue name tags 
you can see it's got Arabic writing down here. Initially, what they wanted to do is get everybody's name tag and have our names in Arabic. Well, it was going to cost too much. So they got the print shop or the patch shop to make a name tag. They just put your name on it, but it underneath, they decided it would always be the same. It's supposed to say Desert Weasels. So after the war was over, I went downtown to get a suit made and we had to wear a uniform. And I go into the shop and the guy's looking at my name tag and he said, you're a budge. Do you know what it says? And I said, uh, yeah, but why don't you tell me what it says? And he said, well, it means one of two things. He says, first, it means they're like a big cat that lives in the desert. I thought, okay, desert weasel, that kind of works. He said, I said, or? He said, or you're the sons of a desert wedding. <laughs> And so we started calling ourselves the 81st Sons of a Desert Wedding Squad. <laughs> but wait, there's more. I had this patch uh, underneath the plexiglass on my desk at Columbus Air Force Base where I was training student pilots. And we used to train some Saudis and even a few Iraqis. And I had a, a, a couple of Saudi students say, sir, do you know what this is? And I told them that story. And he said, no, no, sir, it means something very bad. And I couldn't get him to tell me what it says, but I now believe the desert wedding thing was a euphemism maybe for, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it even better. <laughs> True story. Now, I've actually tried this with an Apple product, you know, the whole visual translate thing. And every now and then it'll say desert wedding. But then when I just hover over it, then it it, it says something more innocuous. So anyway. <laughs> uh, this is just to show what Manama looked like downtown. This is the Grand Mosque. This is some fancy hotel. I can't remember which one. So it looks pretty cosmopolitan, pretty modern. Yeah. Uh, this was the Pearl Monument, which was a very cool thing. However, there was a a, a bloody riot and some deaths there around 1998, I think it was. And so because it became symbolic of this whole uprising, they tore it down. This was the fish monument, which I could tell a funny story, but in case that guy actually watches this podcast someday, maybe not, I'll tell you privately. But I'll just say somebody put an 06's uh, flight cap on top of it and took a picture. <laughs> Uh, there's me in the middle with two of my squadron buds in front of the Pearl Monument. And halfway through the war, they were sending guys to the Cunard Princess for R&R, &R, the love boat. Well, I'm here to tell you, there was no love going on on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and while it looked real fancy on the TV show back in the States, it wasn't that fancy inside. It was kind of cramped and eh. And this showing more of another picture of downtown. It's okay. It kind of looks like any city, except there's things about the Middle East that are just not quite like home. <laughs> um, our CE guys put, built wooden boxes to go over that and then put plastic lids on it so you wouldn't get splinters. Uh, this is the scud hole. I showed you the Patriot battery picture a while ago. I believe it was the fourth or fifth night of the war. And they used to have the nightly news conference in Riyadh. And some 06 or general is conducting the thing. And says, yes, you in the back. And some woman reporter said, sir, can you tell me why the secret air base in Bahrain with more tactical fighters than any other in theater hasn't been targeted by a scud yet? He said, uh, next question. Boom. They shot three scuds <laughs> at us that night. This one allegedly was hit by a Patriot, deflected, and went off three miles to the west of the base. Otherwise, it might have actually hit us. Uh, later in the war, they shot some at us, and by then, we'd stop taking shelter whenever they were doing scud alarms. Um, and that was the one late in the war that killed all those guys in Dharan. But 
It made about a 30 foot crater in diameter, about 15 feet deep. And went, we went to the hole about two years later. It was filled in with sand, just blowing sand and filled it in. Really? The barbed wire was still there. Um, when they launched the Patriot that night to intercept this thing, um, it was around midnight. And the Patriot battery was about a half a mile south of our, our uh, operations area. I was airborne when that happened, but here comes this. Here, they see the scuds coming. They launch a Patriot. The guys in the control tower said the missile was coming right at the tower cab and everybody hit the floor and then it pulled up. Well, the thing took off right over the ops compound and we had a um, enlisted girl, Sherry Jansen. She was a lot of fun. She said, what the hell was that? Because the thing was supersonic when it went over him. And all the guys said, a patriot. And she said, and I quote, what are they doing practicing at this time of night? <laughs> Here's a picture of me after I got out of the cod on the, on the boat. <laughs> all right. So now let's talk about combat missions. And uh, we'll just use this picture. The very first sortie I showed you, we took off, went north, just south of Kuwait. Um, I actually had a film canister stuck in the gun sight. And I used to have some film of it, but I lost it. I actually had a small tape recorder with a patch cord in my G-suit pocket because I wanted to record it. And I've got, I don't know, I might have that someplace, but I don't know where. <sighs> the first wave had attacked during the dark. And we were going in at about seven in the morning. And I thought, we've stirred up a hornet's nest, and now they're going to be out for blood. And so we're out over the middle of the, of the Gulf, and we're arcing around Kuwait City, and it's on fire. There is smoke everywhere. We're in offset box, and we're trying to go in that little throat between Kuwait and Iran. I'm number two. Lead is on my left. I'm, I'm pretty nervous. I've got a harm called up. And remember, I was, I was afraid of MIGs jumping us. <clears throat> We're just about to go feet dry. And I'm looking on the scope and I'm showing there's an SA-6 right in front of us. And I'm thinking, are you shitting me? VQ is going to drag us right over this thing? Now you said you're trying that weasels try to get the Sams to shoot at us. No, what we're trying to do is get them to look at us, but just taunt them. Be, it's like the French taunting in the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> you don't threaten us, English pig dogs. <laughs> so the, the the real game was to try to get them <clears throat> to look at us so that the system could get enough time looking at the signal to locate it. And then we could launch a missile that had greater range than they did, and we could blow them up. Well, it looked like Vinny was going to drag me right over this SA-6. I wasn't digging that too much at all. Meanwhile, number three sees an SA-2 on his scope and decides to blast it. Well, what he didn't know was the Iranians were somewhat concerned about the war going on adjacent to them. So they were monitoring with radars, including SA-2 radars. Long story short, the first missile I ever saw in flight went streaking past my airplane, maybe a thousand feet to the left of me. Well, I didn't know it was a harm. I just knew that the biggest, fastest missile I'd ever seen in my life just went streaking past me. And I thought I'd been shot at by a MiG. So I brake to the left. I didn't call a break for the flight. All the shit that, you, that we practiced left and right, it went right out the window. I'm puking out flares. But I'm also an afterburner, so that didn't do any good at all. And I think, where'd it come from? Where'd it come from? So I roll out from that. Now I'm thinking, where's my flight? So I start tentatively headed back towards where we're supposed to be. The radio is chaos. There's people yelling. There's guard beacons going off. And a couple of threats popped up on the scope. I said, let's shoot. So we, we took two shitty harm shots. And I didn't know where I was, where anybody else was. I said, I think it's time to leave. So we were probably in the target area for five to 10 minutes, turned around and said, now what do I do? How do I get home? 
How do I explain them by myself? Hey, there's some F4s. I'll just join up on those guys. Wait, there's only three of them. It's my flight. So I just tucked myself back in. So here's a funny, here's a funny epilogue to that. At a squadron reunion in 2015 at Luke Air Force Base, I told this story and I said, and I don't think until this moment right now, VQ knew that I was stripped off for that whole time. And the look on his face said I was right. So that was my first sortie. It was, it was, it was not my greatest performance ever. Oh, and it turned out, yeah, as number three, his uh his SA2 shot was in Iran, but we'll just not talk about that. <laughs> Oops. All right. Um, that so that was a daytime sortie, but then after that we switched to nights. <clears throat> so about this was the wettest winter they'd had in I think 60 or 70 years. Um <clears throat> Well, there was a paved taxiway loop to park the jets on. The airplanes were actually parked on aluminum planking, just laid on the sand. The, it rained so much and the ground was so saturated. We often waded through water this deep in the freaking desert to get to the airplane. And it was foggy and low overcast and rainy all the time. So I think it was the third night of the war, we had a mission that went way out west towards a target called H2. It's pretty close to the Jordan border. <clears throat> we're in night trail. Nothing's going on. Not a one of us shot a harm that night. We come out and we've been in the weather for four hours, pretty much from takeoff until we leave. Uh, number one had me join on him because his radar had died. He wanted me to take him to the tanker. I had to creep in. I had to break the rules to, to join on him. I wasn't supposed to get closer than a quarter mile without seeing him. I couldn't see him till about 100 feet. I take him to the tanker, and they put too many tankers and too many fighters in one track, and it was chaos. We had a system in the radar to try to identify your own tanker by a specific code. They were so close together, we couldn't do it. Uh, lead was really low on gas. I wasn't. He went to one tanker. I went to another. I Do you know what the leans are? Yeah. Special okay, so, yeah. So, I mean, there were many nights in the war where I'd be on the tanker getting gas, and I was convinced we were at 135 degrees of bank. And, and that'll mess with your brain. You just learn how to fight it. Well, <clears throat> number three missed the rejoin. And so he had to go to the divert base. And he had, and it had been briefed that the weather was going to be clear. That was at KKMC. Unfortunately, when he got there, not only was it not, it was fogged in, but the army digging a scud trench had cut the power lines to the runway lights and the instrument landing system. And once he went to KKMC, he didn't have enough gas to go anywhere else. And it was about four in the morning. He's trying to, he did a radar approach to 100 feet, I think five times, but he ran out of gas, had to punch oh. out. So that's Kinkalad Military City, KKMC. Yes. That's Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia. Yep. So, they so, were okay. So they go punched ahead. out. How, how high were they where they punched out then? Uh, they were going missed approach when one engine flamed out and back seater got out. And then as, the front seater said as he was going up the rail, he saw the other one was winding down too. The airplane was relatively intact, actually. Um, and they could have salvaged a lot of cockpit parts out of it, but they called up there and said, secure the classified equipment. And I'm told some army major ran up there and smashed everything in the cockpits with a hammer. So oh, really? Christ. army training. Anyway, I still have a piece of that airplane. I, figured, I used to fly with it in my helmet bag because I figured, well, it can't crash twice. <laughs> anyway uh they were fine minor injuries and they were flying with us a couple days later so the next mission with that fresh in our minds we briefed for a kuwait mission that was to support uh, a b-52 strike on the republican guards on the north side of kuwait and we go out to the jets and the fog is unbelievably thick we started and they told us to wait in the chocks F4 burns a shit ton of gas when it's in idle. 
And I'm thinking, there's no way they're going to launch us. And we get ordered to launch that it's a priority mission. And I thought, holy shit. And we are literally picking our way along the yellow stripe at night to find our way to the runway. That was my one and only instrument takeoff I ever did in the Air Force. Um, I don't think you could see more than 50 to 100 feet down the runway. So we take off individually. And as soon as you're 100 feet off the ground, boom, we're out of the fog. It's clear. So now we're, we're an hour behind schedule. So we got to get to the tanker. Well, one of the things that happened during that wet winter, it kicked up, a, the winds aloft were really high. And it was kicking up this really fine dust in the desert. And it would take it to 30,000 feet. And they did two things that we'd never seen before. One, it caused St. Elmo's fire in the windscreen. So you'd see this, these electric little things in the, in the, in the center glass. None of us had seen that before, at least I hadn't. Uh, the other thing it did was it played havoc with, with radio comm. So we get airborne and lead is calling AWACS for the tanker. We can't even talk to AWACS. Oh, shit, now what? He's trying and trying. And I thought, well, shit, we're going to have to go back. We don't have any gas. He says, fuck it. We're going. So we don't even talk. We, don't, we just go in, bypass the tanker. And I'm thinking, we're going to lose four jets tonight. So we go up to where they're supposedly dropping on the Republican guards. And if they did, we never heard them. So now we're tight on gas and we're, we're finally talking a little bit to AWACS. It's broken. And we're trying to get a tanker and there's none. So we have three choices where to go because Bahrain's fogged in. Cutter, or we could, uh, let's see, Riyadh. And there was, oh, and then I think down in uh, UAE. But whichever one we picked, that's what we were stuck with. And <clears throat> Lee drags us directly over Kuwait City on the way out. Now we're at 30,000 feet and we're skimming the cloud tops in the moonlight. The jet didn't really, in this configuration, did not like to fly above about 23 to 24,000 feet. So we're, it's, it was what we called hanging on the blades. Um, could barely do 300 knots. If you did more than 15 degrees of bank, you'd lose airspeed. Well, there was a SA-2 that the Iraqis had put in Kuwait City. And when I was directly over the thing, they shot at me. Now, normally, if it was off to the side, you could maneuver, you could go up, you could go down, you can try to point at it and shoot it. Well, I can't shoot back because it's directly underneath me. The pod, I think the pod actually saved us, uh, but I can't really maneuver against it. I don't want to go downhill into the clouds where I can't see anything. So I just said to LA Bud, chaff and pod. And I could hear him as he's punching out chaff. And on my scope, I saw the track bars from the SA2 and they'd slip off. And they'd come back on, they'd slip off. For the next 15 to 20 seconds, I wondered if how much life expectancy I had. I didn't see it, but number three said he saw the thing come flying out of the cloud tops. I said, what did it look like? He said, like a Saturn V going to the freaking moon, man. <laughs> he shot at it because he was far enough behind that he could. But the Iraqis learned pretty early on that if they kept their radars on all the time, we don't understand it. For some reason, they blow up. <laughs> so they would turn it on, shut it off, turn it on, called blinking. It negates a harm, but it also negates their own SAM guidance. So anyway, we come out of that, still don't tank, and we end up landing in Qatar. And 20 minutes later, they were completely fogged in. Really? And it was F-16s in Qatar. And as we're waiting for gas and weather to clear so we could take the jets back to Sheikh Giza, the ops officer of the F-16 squadron, they'd lost, I think, two jets in the last week. He said, as far as we're concerned, you guys are mission essential equipment. If we go to a target and there's no weasels there, we're going to jettison our bombs and go home. And my, my flight commander, who was a backseater, he looked at me and said, we were weasels before weasels were cool. <laughs> 
All right, uh, next mission, I got that one. Okay, then the last one I wanted to talk about, finally did a day sortie. It was February 12th or something like that. It was late in the war. And number four dropped out and Rudy had a mechanical problem. So it's three of us. And it was up Northwest of Baghdad to support a 12 ship of RAF tornadoes. They were gonna drop laser guided bombs on a railroad bridge. Let me, let me back up on that too. So I got to know a bunch of the guys in 15 squadron during that exchange. And from the get go, they were trying to drop JP 233 on runways and getting their asses kicked. And so, um, John Peters and, um, John Nickel, John Nickel, um, both those guys had dinner at my house one night and, uh, uh, John Nickel, he was he used to call himself the most handsome man in NATO. <laughs> it was hilarious. Anyway, so to see them on TV on the second or third day of the war as POWs, say, well, this just got really freaking personal. So we're going up to support this strike. And we knew there were, there were SA-2s and SA-3s at an airfield, al on the west side of Baghdad. And they were within the radius of this target. So the whole time we're going north, the SA-2, he'd turn on for a little bit and then he'd shut off. He'd turn on and he'd shut off. And I was telling I was telling anybody, just shoot the damn thing. Just shoot him. He said, nah, I'm going to wait. So we go north, we turn west. <clears throat> and the, the tornadoes uh, say, Weasel's picture. And lead says, picture clear. And right at that moment, when the thing was directly at six o'clock to us, doo -doo 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 -doo. I said, two's got a launching two. And he launched in a mode that's called optical mode, which means instead of locking us up with his radar to track us, he's on top of the radar van using a periscope arrangement where he uses a joystick to keep the crosshairs on us. And that transmits a radio control signal to the SAM to guide it to us. Apparently, he thought the harm wouldn't guide that way, but it could. <laughs> so I turn just enough so I can see what's behind us because I can't see Diddley at six o'clock. And it was pretty far away. So we had some time. And the reason I saw it was this huge flame and a gigantic dust cloud. And we both said, there it is. So it turned around. And because of, I didn't want to use burner because we don't have much gas. We're way up north of Baghdad. Um, it's a descending turn. That's called a slice back. Put the thing on the nose. And the thing that saved us was the SAM took off to the southeast and had to turn around and come back. That bought us some time. So he does the target handoff, ready light. I said, shoot. He takes the shot, the left engine compressor stall, that happened all the time. As soon as we'd fly through the exhaust trail of the missile, that engine would compressor stall. Rip it to idle. It's good. Here we go. Now it's got to get away from this thing. So now it's another descending turn, and we run. We'd started around 25,000 feet, and now we're probably down around 14 or 15,000. And we're running. I said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. And L.A. Bud, he could see the thing arcing, coming towards us. He said, I see it. Just take it away. Take it away. And what really made me nervous at night, the, the Iraqis weren't aiming their guns. They just threw up a zillion bullets in every direction. And so it looked like this, this gigantic mushroom of bullets. You saw what it looked like on TV. I thought, I don't see a goddamn thing, but I know it's out here. So it makes it pretty nervous. Anyway, it turns out we beat him by about 10 seconds because L.A. Bud saw our harm blow up. I mean, it was pretty far away, but he saw an explosion. There was a drum roll. And then he said, yes, yes, because the signal had, had died. So he knew we got it. And then moments later, as he's, I'm thinking, shit, well, if we got that, and then I see this huge black cloud at our one o'clock boiling up. And I, thought, and I thought, oh my God, where are the Brits dropping? I think I'm falling through their bomb trail. 
And I said, whoa, 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 what's that black cloud at one o'clock? He said, um, I think that's where the SAM crashed. Ah, and he was right. When the signal went dead, it just went and went past us and crashed in front of us. And the SA-2 has got a huge warhead. So at that point, let's get out of here. I'm trying to figure out where this bridge is so that I don't get bombed by the Brits. Um, anyway, the, the, that is one of my favorite stories because I actually wasn't nervous on that one. It's one of those strange things when you're actually being shot at and you can do something about it. It was all business. And that, that one, that one went good. Um, and that was a confirmed kill on that one too. Oh, and since he was on top of the van guiding the thing optically, his head was right next to the antenna that got blown up too. So he probably got blown up too. All right. Next picture. Ah, this was, so when the war was over, there's this, uh, this was when we were leaving Spangdalem in 94. I designed this, this paint scheme. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but little spook is bowing there on the tail. Oh, nice. Um, after the war, they didn't know what they were going to do with this. So we went, some of us went back to Germany and then they eventually kicked us out of Bahrain and put us in Dharan, which sucked because you could drink in Bahrain. Um, this is in Dharan. These two jets are, have just landed because you can see the drag chute streamers uh, behind them and the doors are open. So they're just waiting to go through D-arm. So we did the no-fly zone forever. Um, Jesus, for the next four years. So we did it and they were, they were downsizing the U.S. Air Force. So I would go to Saudi for three months and fly the no-fly zone down there called Southern Watch. I'd go back to Germany for a month. Then I'd go to Insulik, Turkey and fly the northern no-fly zone for a month. And we just keep going back and forth and back and forth. And that's how I ended up with 238 sorties over Iraq. Um, this is an unusual shot. These are both F4s. You can tell that's an F4. They're conning. And we almost never conned. Um, so we must have been higher in stink. I don't even remember a setup for that. I included this shot. This must be out of the north. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's Saddam Lake right there. And this is the ARN 101, the Arnie 101 navigation display it's showing steer point eight and I guess two minutes and 52 seconds until we get there. That is me in tail 247 doing a formation takeoff in 1992 at Boscom Down. And I didn't even know it was me. Somebody, uh, some phantom nut on a phantom site said, that's you in 247. I said, awesome. Man. Uh, when we were back north, um, we were basically the last deployable F4G squadron. And we were covering both bases, Inserlik and Dharan. So when we flew out of the north, we went back to going flying mixed. So here's from the backseater. Um, with his wing, with our wingman, they'd carry an AMRAM on each side, a heater, and then uh, I think it was four cans of CBU. The idea was that we'd suppress with harms if they acted up, and then they'd drop CBU on them. This is the refueling track over northern Iraq, southern, southeastern Turkey. I, I recognize the terrain there. And what we would do is we'd in both places, it'd take about an hour from takeoff until we get to the tanker. We'd get topped off. We'd go into Iraq for about 20, 30 minutes, come back out, tank one more time, go back in for a second push, come out, go home. Uh, this is in Turkey, tail 263. I, I, one, it shows the, the uh, shark mouth that I designed, but it also shows how low the, the ground clearance was on the harm with the fins. This is the ALQ-131 pod. I love this pod, and I think that's I think that's what saved my ass over Kuwait City that night. I know that's not me, though, because I never flew with the yellow visor. I like the dark one. Come on, you. There we go. I actually took this picture in flight in the plane. And this is post-war. Oh, we've, we've drawn something on the intake there. I can't tell what it is. But that's uh, Dave Brush, one of my favorite backseaters. This is looking northwest in uh, northern 
Iraq. That's the runway at Mosul, which got destroyed, you know, in, in the ISIS war three years ago. And over on the east side of the north, this is the ancient city of uh, Erbil. And I'm going to zoom in. The ancient, ancient city center was built up on a, I don't know if it was an original hill or if they man-made it, but it was basically a like a wedding cake, so it was more defensible. Can you see that? Yeah. There's a lot of interesting things to see. I'm going to go over a little topography here. These are the mountains of southeastern Turkey going into Iraq. This is the Great Zab River. And so we'd see this when we're refueling and say, wow, look at that river. So what we'd do is as soon as we got topped off, I'd send my wingman to trail. And we'd get down in this river valley and race along in afterburner <laughs> and it, it was a shit ton of fun um but they were also quite the mountains were actually quite beautiful too and the reason we we're doing this they wanted us to fly over the kurdish regions to show the flag and say we're here to protect you because that's what we were doing well sometimes we'd go a little bit further south than we're supposed to so this up in the mountains was saddam's palace and you can tell by the two buses and vans that are here, it was already being stripped. There was no, it was just a shell, even in 1993. And I don't even think the basic bricks are there anymore. Um, you can find it on Google, but it's, it's hard to find. Um, somewhere I had a picture of my wingman in an F-16 zooming over this thing, but I can't find it. Now this picture, a little bit, this was west of Mosul. Can you see what it says? Made out of stones in a field, it says Saddam is Iraq and Iraq is Saddam forever. And to get the scale, you can see some vans and some buildings and stuff here. So that took some effort, but uh, it was more of a slogan than a reality, wasn't it? The Iraqis had a, a observatory on a mountaintop southeast of Mosul. And the 23rd Fighter Squadron went to Inserlik, uh, at as the war kicked off, and they tried to shoot a Maverick into an antenna on this mountaintop, except they kind of missed. <laughs> so I don't think that I don't know if that telescope ever did get fixed, but we used to fly by it all the time just because it made a good photo op. Yeah, I think I've I've seen a picture. Starbo who gave me a picture with where it's got one hole in it, well, but in the bottom picture, it's got two holes in it. Someone have another crack at it? That's because the missile kit. I, who knows? And yeah, in the top picture, there's a dent in up, it. Isn't it? On this side, yeah. That yeah. may have been a ricochet, who knows? Yeah, it's beat up pretty bad. Um, this is Saddam Lake, which was uh, pretty close to Syria, and that's the Euphrates. Uh, we used to put sea dye marker in the speed break well and dump it in the lake. Uh, we did that for a year and it never worked. And we found out later it's because it, you have to have salt water. <laughs> but this we saw from the tanker near where we'd start flying down the river. And we couldn't figure out what the hell it was. And it took many, many passes until we could get every day we'd write down a few letters of what this thing said. And it's in Turkish. It's about a half a mile inside the Turkish border from Iraq. So it's a Turkish soldier carrying a gun with a crescent moon. And once we got it written down, we asked somebody to translate it. It said something like, the Turkish soldier is a brave fighting man or something. Basically, it's just bravado to quote. They were thumbing their noses at the Iraqis. Anyway, but that's about where we would start that low level racing along the river. This is in Turkey after I got 2000 hours in the jet. And I didn't know that Dave Brescia was going to set me up for the reception. Um, normally, the maximum speed in the landing pattern, if you come up initial, is 300, maybe 350 knots. Well, at Inserlik, the regulation, whether it was a mistake or not, it said the minimum speed is 350. Well, we wanted to ensure maximum compliance. So we used to come up initial and afterburner doing 625. Why? Because it wouldn't go any faster. <laughs> No, that was a lot of fun. Uh, there's me with the shark mouth. We ended up having about seven airplanes at a time painted. It was against the rules by the wing back home. 
Uh, but the squadron commander was cool. And he said, paint the jets down here. Just wipe it off when they go back home for maintenance. So that was cool. This was a tire failure I had out of Inserlik. Do you know what a retread tire is? When they take an yes. old tire and they put new rubber around it? Yeah. Well, I didn't know it, but they retread F4 tires. A lot of aircraft tires. And the entire retread case came off the tire during takeoff. I had no idea. But it damaged the squat switch. And when I tried to raise the gear handle, it wouldn't move. I said, what the hell? So my wingman, he looked at it. He said, looks fine to me. Well, then the tower called and said, hey, it said there's pieces of tire on the runway. Oh, shit. So we burned off gas and landed, and the tire didn't pop. And maintenance said, can you taxi back to Chalk, sir? I said, sure. So I taxied all the way back home, which was over a mile, and uh, then got pictures. Oh, and it, it put a hole in the aileron and in the speed brake. Did it really? a big, heavy chunk of, wow. of uh, uh, there was fun to be had. Uh, Star Baby, I think, actually, actually was the primary guy that made this happen, but it was based on a funny entry in the Doofer book. And since the standard 3 1 code word for friendly fighters is chicks, there was a double entendre here that chicks dig weasels, weasels dig chicks. This is now an officially banned patch by the U.S. Air Force, and I could not be prouder. <laughs> um, here's a VC-10 out of Anserlik. Um, I have another shot somewhere. We were, we were trying to make it look like I was refueling the VC-10 by putting the hook down. There's another one where it, it, it you know, I'm actually further away, but uh, it was a good gig. Now, the reason we're doing all this they had this female navigator that was really cute and I was single. So I was trying to make some points. It didn't work. Some, some of your readers will probably know they called her Bob. Well, if anybody knows who Bob is, let us know. Probably. I think her real name was Laura. Bob is uh, so Bob was a character in um, Blackadder. You ever see Blackadder? Okay. Uh, I've seen bits and pieces. I know you okay. guys love that. It's, it's um, an excuse to fly next to the EF-111, call sign Elvis, and another picture next to the BC-10. This was an, actually a sanctioned photo shoot for PR purposes. So I'm with Ed Tuna Fisher here, and I think the picture was taken by a French Jaguar, because I think they had the reconnaissance pods. And that was uh, an RAF GR-7, I believe, at the time. Great pick, though. Because I was inverted. <laughs> so it took an hour to go from Inserlik to uh, the tanker track and back. And so I said, you want to try flying formation while one of us is inverted? So this is not a momentary thing. My wingman is pushing forward on the stick and holding level flight and hanging by the straps in there. <laughs> and we did that to say, the hook is up, not down. <laughs> But that's uh, so these fields denote that this is probably near Diabakur in uh, Turkey, roughly halfway between Inserlik and Iraq. And there's another shot doing the same thing. The fuel vent mast is at the back of the airplane, and under negative or zero G, they like to leak. So that's what's happening there. That's fuel leaking out. This is our parking area in, uh, in Turkey. With old generation shelters. That's me shit faced at a toga party we did there. My toga is made out of the shower curtain from the BOQ room. Um, yeah, we were all doing it. The French threw the party. It was the, the new Bougelet party in September, I think it is. And they'd flown in a French KC 135 full of wine, bre uh, bread, brie, and fruit. And it was a grand old time. Brilliant. Um, this is on the balcony out in front of the BOQ rooms in Inserlik and, uh, and a much younger version of myself. And uh, I think the smile says that, well, being a wild weasel was just the greatest thing ever. So going back then to the point you were making about the RAF low-level tactics, the fact that you guys had trained low-level tactics in West Germany for a 
the push to the folder gaps through the folder gap. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then your transition to medium level tactics. What did that do for your uh, confidence then in flying the airplane after the war? Because you said that you said, interestingly, that ascribing to the Iraqis a level of capability that was higher, much higher, much, much above their uh, true capability gave you confidence after the war and you thought well these guys are not going to be as good as the people we fly against in red flag and the wick instructors and all that kind of stuff so so how did the change of tactics to medium level affect what you did when you got back to spang then notwithstanding the fact you were then just going back to saudi and and turkey for the no-fly zone stuff that's actually an outstanding question um i ended up going to tlp in 1992 and I think, I think they did that because uh, F4 Weapons School had already been closed. But the next thing I knew, they made me the squadron weapons officer, which was normally a position for a weapons school guy. And so I decided, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to start writing my own tactics newsletter for the squadron. And I called it Spike Speak. And it, it started because... I said, God, if we follow the tactics that are in the manuals, we always get our asses kicked. This is stupid. And then I started noticing certain things such as, let's see, we're carrying the AIM-7F, so are the F-15s. Why can they shoot at a longer range than I can? So I started digging into stuff and I started, and I really started to become a tactical thinker. And I, I advocated doing things that were more based on likely scenario from your opponent instead of worst case and i'd say i kind of split the squadron there were guys that said holy shit that makes sense and then there were the other guys said ah that's not the way we were taught he said well you can do it that way if you want so i'll give you an example um it used to be standard dictum that if you were locked up by an enemy fighter jettison your tanks and get ready to dog fight and i said no, we're not going to do that. Why not? I said, well, okay, let's, let's just assume that it's a big 29. It was the best fighter the Iraqis had. I said, if you put out chaff, it's not going to work that good against the pulse Doppler radar. But I said, but if I need chaff and I jettison my tank as a 4,000 pound piece of chaff, it's not going to just stop in space like chaff does. It's going to keep moving at 500 knots. I said, that's probably a better piece of chaff than chaff. Then I also had an idea that um, in a head-on shot, if a, if a fulcrum was stupid enough to lock me up at long range, I was going to shoot a harm at him. Now, harm's not designed to go against an airborne target, but there was a way that we could force it to. And I said, one of two things will happen. If he does nothing, it might actually get lucky in Spiro. I said, on the other hand, he might look out and say, Holy Allah, that's the biggest smoke trail I've ever seen in my life. I'm out of here. I said, so it's win-win, either way. <laughs> um, and my tactics were validated. Uh, when I got to Nellis, well, actually, in the desert, I, I led a four-ship and against an F-15 four-ship, this kid said, hey, can you be my adversaries tomorrow for my check ride? Sure. I said, what kind of tactics do you want? He said, what do you mean? I said, you want this scripted Soviet stuff or you want my best effort? He said, oh, your best effort. Well, I came up with tactics that I figured would screw with the Eagle and he busted his check ride. Later that day, I saw the instructor from his four-ship in the base gym we do the so so after a while he comes he says hey um where'd you get your tactics i said well i analyzed this this and you'd probably want to do this and this and this and he said your tactics are right on right really? and that encouraged me so i did something similar at nellis where i led a four ship of weasels against a four ship of f-16s from weapons school it had two instructors and two students. Both students busted the ride. Really? Yeah. And they should have kicked our asses because they were six AMRAM and two heat in the gun. And we were three AIM-7 
and four heat, no gun. Um, the head of F-16 Weapons School Division was in the flight. And he accused Jay Voss and me of going out of the airspace to sneak in behind them. <clears throat> I said, no. I said, you had goddamn AWACS. You were watching us the whole time. Look at their tapes. We we're right where we were supposed to be. And then when I told, he said, but I didn't, this, this, I said, you didn't have to. And he was dumbfounded that what I had done would actually work. Wow. But on the other hand, one of the last ones I did, I left an eight ship of F4s against an eight ship of Eagles right at the end. We got our asses kicked. Why? I didn't know it. We were guinea pigs. The, the F-15s had data link. It was brand new. So they were data linked to, from AWACS to every Eagle, and we couldn't explore, exploit the beam notch on nine airplanes at the same time. But anyway, it worked for a while. Now, for the Brits, when you brought that up, they, they quickly learned that cutting runways was pointless when the Iraqis weren't even flying their jets anyway. And, and then they wanted laser-guided bombs. So we gave them a bunch of LGBs, but they didn't have anything to laze with. Enter the Buccaneer. Because the tornado couldn't laze, so they used the Bucks as the laser designator. And then uh, later, I think, and they were paved spike pods. No relation. <laughs> Anyway, so they went to uh, medium altitude as well. But the, unfortunately, the tornado with its tiny wings, it was designed to go low and fast. And I think with a bomb load, they really couldn't get much higher than about 15,000 feet. Hmm. You just referenced your call sign. You haven't told us about that. Ah, that's, oh, and I got, I've got one for you. So when I showed up at Spangdalem, I'd, I'd gotten a bad haircut. And the only way to even it out was to just cut it shorter. And I kind of liked it. I said, you know what? Maybe that's just how I'll wear it now. And I got lucky and got named Spike that way. Um, it was also because I got drunk at my naming ceremony. Well, because they, they're feeding you uh, Jeremiah Weed. So I'm shit-faced. And then they pissed me off. And they thought I was like a rabid dog named Spike. <laughs> but the only other person I know with the name of Davies would be Dave Davies of the Kinks. And their most famous song would be, <laughs> no, come on, it's a British band. <laughs> you don't, don't know, know the Kinks? I know and who the they are. song, Lola? No. How's okay, it going? Well, their for most us. famous song is Lola. <laughs> Lola. La 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 hola, and then uh, oh that one, yes, uh, okay, yes. Sorry, yes, I, yes, I, uh, so we, yeah. So I was thinking we could call you Lola, which stands for Leeds Online Audience. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Did, did anyway, you have, that's how I got Spike. So did Did you have any um? So really, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know. Um, so sort of spiritual moments during the war was was there was there any at any point? One of the things that I'm always interested to hear is that you know everybody talks about being young and being bulletproof, and they don't think about death and so on and so forth. But was there were there any moments during I the did. war where, <laughs> yeah, where you, you sort of thought about mortality? Um, did it change you in any way? You know, did it mean you you led life differently thereafter? Mm, not, not significantly. No, I'm. I, despite all my profanity, I, I'm a fairly spiritual, religious guy. I go to church. Um, you know what's funny about combat is it's silent. Okay, the radio is going crazy and the RWR is beeping at you. But when you see explosions outside, they don't make any sound. And we wanted to support the Republican or a B-52 strike on Republican guards one night. It was a three-ship cell, each B-52 dropping 48 cans of CBU. Each can has got, I don't know, 250 bomblets in it. 
So, and it was clear that night. So we're orbiting there, just kind of watching. And I see. I went, as, I, as I watch, and then the next one, slightly offset, and then the next one. And I, I saw this huge swath at night turn into fire. And I said, holy shit, I actually kind of feel sorry for those guys. Um, seeing the highway of death when we thought there was a dead body or, or a carpool of them in each vehicle was kind of numbing. Uh, every time I read about a coalition aircraft that went down, that bothered me. I worried about myself. I worried about all my buds. Hmm. I worried about the guys in 15 squad. I mean, and it turns out one of the guys that I knew did die. They got shot down. Um, what was his last name? I think it was Woodsy. Um, <clears throat> the only dead person I actually saw during the war was an army major that died of a heart attack in the chow hall. Wow. Kind of strange, huh? Yeah. I'll so I, um, I kept a audio diary on a cassette recorder and I did make a videotape for my infant daughter before I left in case I didn't come back. Did you keep that? And that was hard. I still have it. And have you ever shared that uh, with her? Um, she's mentally handicapped, so I don't know if she'd understand the full gravity of it, but, but, uh, when my wife was alive and she, she found it, not her mother, but, uh, second wife, she and my stepdaughter said, what's this tape? And they, I came home from work that day and they were bawling because they said, Oh my God, we saw your tape. Don. Like a, so you did. All right. It worked. <laughs> um, but yeah, you had to think about that stuff. You know. Hmm. Uh, there's a yeah, online I, at least there's a there's a video. I would say it didn't change me. I would say it reinforced it. How's that? Yeah, yeah. There's a video online, Spike. That's of. I think it's on YouTube of an F4G pilot after a mission. And he looks really harrowed. I mean, he, he looks, uh, and I think it might have been the squadron commander. I, I don't know if it was, or I think it was an O. I think it's, I think the one you're talking about is John boy Walton. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Him. He just, he mm -hmm. looks harrowed. Was, was that how it was? Um, Initially, it, it was fatiguing, you know, because the, the Kuwait sorties were typically in the two and a half to three hour range. And if you're going out west or Baghdad, they were four and a half to six. So you're up there a long time. And it was it was it was cold as shit. So in case you punched out, you had to be dressed warmly to survive the night in the desert. So we were wadded up in in winter clothing. Our pockets were jammed full of escape and evasion maps. Um, man is carrying a goddamn ground chemical warfare mask in the airplane because the one that was designed for pilots, even they knew at that point, yeah, it doesn't work. So just carry this other one. Um, it's fatiguing. And okay, I, after that first day sortie on day one, then I was typically briefing at 11 o'clock at night taking off at around midnight 30 and landing at 6 30 in the morning. Now you're laying in bed, listening to jets take off all day and about every three hours. Scott alarm, Scott alarm. And you're, and you're trying to sleep at the wrong time of day. <clears throat> and there's all this noise and you're thinking, oh, fuck in, in 10 hours, I have to go up and do that again. So there was a lot of mental exhaustion that way. Okay, there's a story. They said, we've got go pills and stop pills. A go pill to keep you awake and a stop pill to help you sleep. I, thought, I don't need that shit. And it was, I think, the fourth night of the war. And we're going way out west. Two tankers before we even go into Iraq. And then two tankers to come home. 
Lee is on the boom getting gas. I'm right next to him. We used to do that called quick flow. One guy's on the boom getting gas, and the wingman is in fingertip close to him. So as soon as he disconnects, boom, you're in there. Instead wow. of being on the wingtip of the tanker, we got really good at that. I, I estimate I've probably refueled between seven and 800 times. Wow. That I've probably got over 70 hours physically connected to the tanker. Um, so I'm waiting my turn, and all of a sudden I go, oh! L.A. says, what's the matter? I said, holy shit, I just fell asleep. Ugh. And I was falling asleep. I could not stay awake. I said, L.A., take the jet. Because Air Force, Air Force, you know, as Star Baby showed you, it's got a stick in the back. I said, I can't stay awake. So I locked my heart. I said, tell me when Vinny's done. So I, I hate, I hang in the straps there for about five minutes. He said, he's coming off the boom. Okay. I get my gas. We're done. We go to the other wing. Three's getting his gas. I gave it back to him. We go back through for one more top off. Do the same thing. <clears throat> uh, and it started to happen again at the next tanker. So the next night I brought a go pill with me. Put it in my sleeve pocket. Okay, let me try that. Take the pill. I'm awake. Awesome. Except I also found out it meant it makes you go. And I'd never used a piddle pack in the airplane. Never carried one. Never needed to. Well, by the time we're going feet into Iraq, I got to go really bad. It hurts. We fly the whole sortie up there, come out, and I'm about to die. It hurts so bad. And Ellie Budd was the life support officer. And he says, use your water bottle. I said, what? Use your water bottle. I said, I've got this little plastic bottle in my g -suit. I said, I don't want to piss in that. He said, no, not that one. The vinyl thing that's in your survival vest. Hmm? There's this thing that looks like a big vinyl whoopee cushion. You know what a whoopee cushion is? You know, you sit on it. It sounds like a fart. I didn't even know it was in there. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the thing held three pints and I filled it. I still had to go, but I wasn't in pain. Well, from then on, I carried a piddle pack, but I don't think I ever used it again. It was just that one time. Anyway. Did you see, Spike, did you see the Iraqis adapting to you? Um, so you talked about changing tactics, about them yes. blinking. What did they do? So so um weasel call signs were all beers so we flew with coors falstaff Oli, bud miller and we did that for i think over three years until the saudis found out we're using alcohol as call signs and then they made us change it um the eagles were cars ford chevy dodge I forget what the F-16s were. I think they were different kinds of snakes, like, uh, I don't know, Rattler, Viper. I can't remember. I remember the tankers were fish. They were Mako, Tuna. I don't think they used Flounder. Um, and then AWAX was, it was either Dragnet or Dark Star. Anyway, everyone had kind of a theme to their call sign. Well, all the other fighters started using beer call signs because we thought, or they thought, the Iraqis were listening. It's another beer. You will turn off the radar now. And I think that whole myth was horseshit. I mean, we were told after the war that the Iraqi army guys were taking the batteries out of their walkie-talkies because they thought a harm could home in on it. I don't think they were that smart. I don't think they could listen to our radios. I don't think if they listened, they could even tell what we were saying. But they definitely blinked, though. And that SA-2 shot that I told you about, that just, you know, we just barely beat him, that was the only shot I took where the guy stayed on the air the entire time. And so that one definitely guided. But, yeah, they were, they were trying to adapt. So they, instead of using the target tracking radars, just the missile guidance, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. They, they have so we used to have... Go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, I was, I was going to ask whether or not they, they sort of networked at all in any way, whether 
what, what you know tracking radar on one side of you would be doing its thing but then the missile would come from a different site somewhere else or anything mildly sophisticated like that i don't know what i don't think so. for that but um in theory the french had built in this system called the carry system which is iraq spelled backward um but my guess is if it was still operational they didn't know how to use it i don't think i ever saw cooperative definitely no cooperative sam coordination there may have been some early warning stuff where they said hey we on our air traffic control radar we see a big package of airplanes coming this way but that's probably more by telephone than anything else and did you ever see a mig then presumably not i never saw a mig the only time uh that i ever even had radar contact on a mig was with uh, tuna fisher in the northern no-fly zone and the guy was airborne and he flew up to about 20 or 30 miles south of the 36 parallel and we locked him up and we turned on the continuous wave so that if he had a radar warning receiver it would have been beeping and tuna said well, he's not doing anything i said he's flying a russian-made airplane maintained by Iraqis and they fly once a month if they're lucky. So if the RWR even works, he probably doesn't know what it means. So we cooked him for about 20 miles until we had to turn for the border. <laughs> that was fun. Oh, uh, when you were talking about uh, trying to get EW and stuff, the other aircraft had to avoid the no fly lines by, I think it was 20 miles. But we were allowed to go right up to the line. So with any rule that was in the AOR, we said, except for weasels. <laughs> and we would get a half a mile to a quarter mile away from the line and just troll. We were trying to get them to turn on a radar so that we could shoot them. This is all post-war stuff. Yeah. Um, they, they, never, they never took the bait because they knew better. What was your what was your game plan, Spike? Then, if you did come up against the Mick, what what were you going to do? Because you've so from an armament point of view, you've got no gun, you don't have any heaters because those have been displaced by the um, ALIC or whatever it is for the harm. And uh, so you've got these two AIM sevens. Um, what what were you going to do? I was fangs out. Uh, I was flying with Jay Voss one day. We had an F-16 wingman. We were on the eastern side of Mosul. We had just, we had just dragged the line. Of course, nothing happened. We're slowly working our way around the city to go back to the tanker. And AWACS calls out uh, some bullseye bogey. And I'm doing the mental math because it didn't present on our scopes. It had to be done up here. I said, that's right behind us. And it's north of the line. And I called for a hook because I wanted to fucking shoot them. And I turned on my CW and tuned my AIM-7s, and I yelled for bogey dope, and they called that. And this thing was, they were calling this thing out six miles behind us. And Jay wanted to go. He said, let's get out of here. Said, and I thought, at this point, I thought, no, they're not as good as we are. And I had, I said, what do you got? He said, nothing. I asked Wing, I said, picture. And he, and he had a momentary hit, he thought, on something. I said, you got to the lead. Because he had A9s and AMRAMs. And I thought, hell, if he can take the first shot and I can follow up, I'll stick my pin in that cushion. Um, well, then we had nothing. We drove all the way down south to the 36th parallel, and we had to turn around again. And so we started heading north. AWACS calls the same thing. I said, what the hell? So we turn around to it again. Nothing. Well, now we need to go to the tanker. And I finally figured it out it was a fault on AWACS's radar scope. It was a it was a mirror image of us in six mile trail. Oh. They didn't know that. I figured it out because it was always exactly six miles south of us, no matter where we were. Yeah. Well, last question, I was ready. Probably. I thought, you know, what's that? But go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm done. I, I just want. That was, that, that was my plan with the, the AIM-7 wasn't that good, but I figured I was good enough. So, so last question for me, Spike, then. What, what, um, 
we were introduced by Star Baby. You must have a Star Baby mm-hmm. story. You got a, you got any doubt on him that you can share with us? Nothing too embarrassing, but I want you to tell his naming ceremony story. But I, I don't know if you'll do that because it, because yeah, he had a, yeah, he had a call sign before before Star Baby. He had a call sign, didn't he? Yes. So he was he showed up in the squadron in 1991 after the war, and we were doing our very last weapons deployment to Zaragoza, Spain. I was the master of ceremonies. We were holding it in the Rod and Gun Club at Zaragoza Air Base. Place was packed. And there's always a lot of alcohol involved. He doesn't drink. But we knew already that he was a huge classic Star Trek fan. And so in the Doofer book, you get to put down, you know, it's opened up to guys that already have a call sign, suggested call signs for the new guys. The FNGs that they're called. You know what that means. F and new guys. So the ceremony goes like this. I'm holding the do for book. We're, we're doing the funny thing from the Holy Grail. I'm going, <laughs> and uh, I'm playing up the whole thing. And so I say, FN new G, FN G Pietruca. And so they lead him to a stool. So usually it was a swivel stool um, elevated. Normally with the drinkers, they'd make them drink a huge round of Jeremiah weed. And then we'd put a bag over their head and spin them around. And so now they're drunk under the bag doing this. Well, we couldn't do that with him because he's non drinker. And so I said, are there any nominations from the congregation? And usually you'd hear asshole plus peg number. Peg number is the slot where your helmet and your parachute harness were. Um, um, Someone would yell, give us Barabbas! Um, <laughs> Monkey Volva! Eh, those are the usual opening nominations. And, and then somebody would say, and then I'd say, well, I have in the book, and I would read off the nominations, and then we'd do a, a, a voice vote off. You know, the loudest thing would win. I didn't even get that far. But as he's taking his seat on the chair, the crowd starts going, Spock, 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 <laughs> Spock, Spock, and the place is going crazy. And the, the, the DO looks at me with it. Well, are you going to make it official? I said, wait, we have some accoutrements. <laughs> We'd already rigged this ahead of time. So my buddy Sean Copeland comes up and he's got two cardboard Spock ears that we made. We have fixed them with with the masking tape, <laughs> and now the crowd goes ballistic, and it is done. <laughs> and that was how he became Spock. And I, someone just told me that the very oh my buddy Jethro told me that the very first deployment he did to Daran, he showed up at some meeting and he had Starfleet patches on his flight suit, <laughs> and. <laughs> The uh, the debt commander said, take that shit off. That is humiliating. And I think he was the one who renamed him Star Baby at that point. Oh, was that him? <laughs> I think so. But I still don't know if it was ever officially done. I never saw it. So, <laughs> anyway. Spike, um, thank you hey. for joining us yes, sir. once again. It's been great listening to you tell us your uh, stories from the war and talk us through it. Actually, and this is the first time it's ever been done with uh, pictures. I don't know if they were backing it up or leading. I don't know, but the pictures were cool. So thank you very much for spending the time to do that. I didn't really, I wasn't expecting it. You said to me, you got some pictures. It does. Yeah, it does. It It does. I was going to use this analogy. Um, If the difference between narration and doing it with pictures is the same as the difference between erotic literature and pornography. I figured you could appreciate that. <laughs> well, it's been great. Uh, it's been great having you on again. Thank you. And um, maybe you'll come back and uh, you'll talk to us a bit about instructing the T thirty eight. You did. Did you say four and a half thousand hours as an instructor in the T thirty eight? There must be some pretty interesting stories that you have to share from that time. And and we should cover OV ten. Two and a half years. We've got to give some love to the OV ten, even if there wasn't much to it. But maybe you'll come back and do that with us. Absolutely, as my schedule. Thanks, Mike.
Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.